So we're continuing on with the message uh, series called God's Anointed, and we're talking about how God anointed Saul and David, but more importantly, how God uh, gives us his Holy Spirit, he anoints us, whatever he calls us to do, he equips us to do. But it's our responsibility if God is going to give us the Spirit of God and to give us the anointing. This is the Old Testament way to say, hey, you're set apart. It's our responsibility to do something with the gift that God has given us. God hands us a gift. It's wrapped like a beautiful present. It's valuable. It has incredible power attached to it. And with it comes a great deal of responsibility. It's kind of like the old Spider-Man line, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And the story here that we've been studying, and this is the last in the series, is this uh, comparison between poor Saul, who doesn't get it, and David, who grows up into it. Saul is anointed, and he takes his own way, and he makes his own decisions, and he continues to fall away from God, and continues to be disobedient, so much so that God says, I'm going to remove my spirit's blessing from you, and I'm going to give it to David. This young boy, 14, 15 years old, who already has a character that is going to be the foundation for being a good king. Saul, let the power go to his head. Saul, let the power and control and the authority that he was given be abused by him and by others. And I imagine that you have in your life and in your situations been involved in a scenario where your employer abused their power over you in the employment situation that you were in. They took advantage of you. They didn't pay you appropriately. They asked you to do things that weren't your responsibility. They took credit for things that you did. They were the ones who abused their power and authority. Maybe uh, you are, um, had a teacher when you were a kid. A teacher who abused their power and authority. They uh, sidestepped the relational component with the children and went straight for obedience and authority in, in the discipline of the children. Maybe you've had a parent. When you grow up, your parent abused their power and authority that they uh, skipped the love that was supposed to be unconditional and out of that love should come the uh, actions that they were to carry out as ordained by God to love and to care for children. God says, train up a child in the way they should go and in the end they will not depart from it. Why? Not because you force obedience on a child, but because you love them unconditionally like God loves us. And when you love them unconditionally and you lead them towards the truth, they will walk towards that truth because they can see in you what is expected, but also the love that comes from the parent who's going to show a child the way. Abuses of power and authority happen all the time. It happens in the church. And if you're a follower of the news over the last little while, you know that we are not exempt from that. Employers have a problem with this. Parents have a problem with this. Schools have a problem with this. Institutions have a problem with this. And I want to outline for you why it is a problem today, how power and authority and a responsibility get put out of whack, and how it is that we can keep things in the right order. Now, when we read an Old Testament passage like we're going to today, I want you to remember one thing. A good solid interpretation tip when you read the history of the people of Israel in the Old Testament is that you have to remember that it's not just a linear story after story history of what happened to the people of Israel, although it does follow that line. They wrote it not for historical reasons. So when we read the Old Testament stories, the history... So it's different from the Psalms and different from the Proverbs and different from Daniel and Ezekiel, which have all kinds of other different principles attached to them. But when we read the history, we have to remember that they're telling a story because they want to reflect God's glory and they want that glory to shine on what's happening. And sometimes it's really bad and other times it's really good. And there are consequences to both. And so the story of Saul and David is the writer of the history going, this is who God is, 
And this is who Saul was. This is who God was, and this is who David is. And they're supposed to reflect God's glory. He's the king of the universe. He's the one that we look to for all things. But us finite human beings, and you and I can all put our hands up and say, we have screwed that up probably pretty good in our lives at one point or another. And I can say that too with (laughs) some degree of uh, strenuousness. So let's look at the end of the story of Saul. Saul finally, if you were here last week and we talked about the witch of Endor, Saul finally hits the bottom. He disregards God, he disobeys God, he does his own thing, and finally God stops answering his prayer. And instead of repenting, instead of saying sorry and going back to him and making amends to God, he decides to find a spiritist and a medium to get the answers that he needs. And the evil spirit that speaks to him says, you just made the worst mistake of your life. This time tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. And so the next day, 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 1 to 8. Now the Philistines attacked Israel, and the men of Israel fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closed in on Saul and his sons, and they killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malashua. Here again. One of the hardest things about understanding the Bible is uh, figuring out how to say all these names. Uh, The fighting grew very fierce around Saul, and the Philistine archers caught up with him and wounded him severely. Saul groaned, to his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died beside the king. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer and his troops all died together that same day. When the Israelites on the other side of the Jezreel Valley and beyond the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their towns and fled. So the Philistines moved in and occupied their towns. The next day, when the Philistines went out to strip the dead, they found the bodies of Saul and his three sons on Mount Gilboa. Saul's death here ends the kingship of the man that had been king for almost 40 years. It's the rise of someone who ignored the fact that God was king and he was only a vice regent. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's that someone who's appointed in the king's place because the king can't rule. Oftentimes that would happen when uh, the new king, after the old king died, was probably five years old or four years old. Someone would be appointed vice regent in their place because they couldn't actually be king. They had to rule for the king. So Saul is a vice regent. That's the way God intended for the kingship of Israel to be formed. That he was king and he gave his authority to a human being And Samuel, the prophet, spent four chapters in the book of 1 Samuel outlining how this king was to behave, what was legal, what was not legal, how he was supposed to do the kingship, and how he's supposed to be dependent on God and go to God first for all things. All of this was set up, and Saul basically packed it up and threw it out, and over the course of 40 years, tries to kill David. David, he tries to kill David several times by throwing a spear at him, uh, having men hunt him down. David could have killed Saul twice, cutting off the hem of his robe once, saying, see, look, I'm not out to kill you. And the character of David is now brought into light and saying, God is the king. He is the one who's going to remove Saul. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take vengeance upon this man who's tried to kill me now several times. My integrity won't allow me to do it. Remember Andrea's sermon when she talked about that, that matter of integrity? And Saul hadn't learned. God wasn't looking for a clever king. He was looking for someone whose heart was surrendered to him. Saul tried to take his own approach to kingship rather than simple obedience and submission. And we don't like that word, submission. As a matter of fact, I I wrote it into my dissertation and uh, the professors 
uh, came back to me and said, you know, that, that, uh, the fact that you are talking a lot about submission in your dissertation is going to require more dialogue from you and more information from you because far too many people would get confused about you talking about submission because it has uh, taken on a connotation in our society that to submit means to give of yourself without control, to allow somebody have to have power over you, that you have no choices anymore, that there is no way that you can make any, like slavery is submission. And that's not the biblical idea of submission at all. Submission is like when I get married, like the two of you guys, when you got married, you looked at each other. Remember we had this conversation and you give yourself to each other, you submit 100% and she submits 100% and you lift each other up in that submission. You see, I voluntarily give myself to you. And it's the same thing with God. When God says, I will give my son's life for you. I came here to serve you, not to be served. I am king, and yet I have come to serve. I even washed the disciples' feet. And in return, we say voluntarily, God, we give ourselves to you. God makes this covenant promise. But our kingdom responsibility is still to engage in the warfare that we are called to. Now, a lot of ladies in the room are going to, you know, get a little nervous here, and all the men in the room are going, okay, finally somebody talking my language, right? Um, you know, uh, we're kind of designed that way, us guys. We think about fighting for things, and we think about courage, and we think about leadership, and we think about the, uh, the way in which we can overcome the odds. And a lot of women are like that too, but it tends to be a bit more of a man thing. So I'm not, I'm not saying women don't have that. You know, It's like saying men don't know how to love or they don't have emotions or something like that. But that's not the case either. But uh, women tend to be more nurturing. They tend to be uh, the ones, ones who think about the emotions first and guys think about it later. So, uh, but there's still a responsibility to carry out the task of the king. So I brought a whiteboard here. Some of you know how much I love whiteboards, and, um, and I'm going to draw a shape here. And if you want to, you can come up later and you can take a picture of it so that you can remember. Um, but basically, what happens with Saul is he becomes king. And God gives him this ability to become king. He says, I have anointed Saul as king, and he will rule in my place. By the way... Uh, God didn't want any kings in Israel. The people wanted a king. They came to Samuel and said, we want a king. Everybody else has got a king. We want a king. We don't want judges anymore. We just want somebody to rule over us. And God said through Samuel, you're going to regret it. And they did. Because he's going to abuse his power. That's what it says in Samuel chapter 8 through 12. He's going to abuse his power. He's going to tax you to the hilt. He's going to require you men and women to serve in, in, the, uh, in the regency of the king. You're going to be overburdened because of this. Anyway, king, Saul is king. But he has authority. Primarily through the army and through the system and because the people have given him the authority. And out of that authority, he wields power. Now you think of any uh, institution. Parents have authority and they wield that authority, their power. Your boss, he may not be king, but he thinks might think he is king. And he has authority, he can fire you and hire you and raise your wages or, or not. And he has power over you to tell you what to do because you are getting paid for what you... Any institution happens this way. And in the kingdom of God, what happens is that throughout the, the Old Testament, we're looking up, remember the story, the history of God's people is God is the king and God the king says, I delegate authority. And this is where Saul should have been. Not here. This is God's job. God is king. He is the regent. He is majesty. He is the one who created all things. He said, Saul, I'm going to put you in a place of authority. But what happens here is that Saul refused to submit. Because the way to receive God's authority is through submission. 
when Saul goes to his heavenly father, at least for the first year or so, he submits to God and he says, God, it's your plan. I will carry out your will. This is your country. I will do as you ask me to. David carried out this authority, received this authority and carried out and used the power because he submitted to God. What did Saul do? Saul That should be in our rebellion. This is the way God intended for the responsibilities of the kingdom to be carried out. He said, I'm the king. And when you get that right, I will give you authority. And when I give you authority, it's because you have submitted to me. What did Jesus do? Jesus, who is the king, he submitted himself. And what happened when he submitted himself? He said... To us, I have give, been given all authority in heaven and earth. Now go and make disciples of all nations. God gave Jesus the authority. Jesus was here. God gave Jesus the authority. And when he gave him authority, he said, now go. Go and make disciples. Obey. When you get this right... The power and authority of God goes with you. Just listen to these verses for a minute. What authority has Jesus given? Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. He says, go. He has given us authority to overcome all power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. Luke 10, verse 19. He has given us authority to go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Mark 16, verse 15. Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And when he does that, what kind of power do we have access to? We have the same power and authority that Jesus had access to. Jesus said, I have come to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that God's judgment will come, but that he is also here on earth now as he is in heaven. This comes because of the Holy Spirit. When I submit to God, when I say, God, you are the king and I am your servant, When Jesus said, Heavenly Father, you are the one in control, I submit to you. When Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I am not here to be in charge, to be your king. I am here to be your servant. When you get this right, you can use power to bless others the same way that Jesus, to care for the poor, to watch over the sick to see justice done. You, you carry out power through the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you do it with that, love becomes the primary measure by which you enact these things. But far too many uh, pastors and preachers and business leaders and parents and uh, people in authority skip this and they go this way rather than this way. And whose authority do they have then? Their own. Who gets to set the agenda? Who gets to make the rules? They do. And that's where it all goes wrong. One of my favorite authors is Bill Hybels. Uh, I've read all of his books. These are just three of them. This is probably the one that has been most helpful to me, Courageous Leadership. Uh, This one, Axioms, Powerful Leadership Proverbs, and this one called Simplify, 10 Practices to Unclutter Your Soul. Bill Hybels, I had a chance, wonderful to meet him. Uh, He's uh, the preacher at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. At one point, up to 27,000 people, many campuses. Uh, The Leadership Summit has been a blessing, a huge blessing to Discovery Church, which he started. I was able to go to Victoria, B.C., uh, go on an island tour, uh, a boat tour, pardon me, with him, whale watching with a bunch of other leaders, which was so cool. Like, you know, you get to meet your hero, right? Even had a chance to, it's kind of funny, I was going off to take a break, go to the bathroom, standing in the bathroom, Bill Hybels comes right up next to me. (laughs) I'm peeing right next to Bill Hybels. (laughs) 
I'm like, how are you doing? Good, how are you? <laughs> Can I have your autograph? No, I didn't say that, no. A, a hero of mine. But unfortunately, a few years ago, that hero of mine was embroiled in a, in a scandal at his church. They had the resignation of the founder, Bill Hybels, who was accused of sexual harassment and abuse of power. The co-pastors who succeeded Bill Hybels also resigned not long afterwards, followed by the entire church eldership board. Hybels has denied any wrongdoing. And in a 2019 investigation by the group of outside Christian leaders found the allegations against him credible. Power. When God slips out of this ranking, we then act on our own authority and we abuse power. We enter into rebellion. Uh, just recently, uh, Bruxy Cavey in the Meeting House in Ontario, the largest uh, megachurch in Canada, former pastor is now facing substantiated allegations of sexual misconduct, and they've reported one claim involving a minor. 38 complaints have been registered between Bruxy and three other staff members in Ontario. And it's not just sexually inappropriate things. I mean, this is also uh, some of the heroes that I have, uh, you know, held up in high esteem. The author James McDonald from Vertical Church, he wrote this book, Lord Change My Attitude, which has also been really great about, um, you know, how God changes and transforms our thinking and our thoughts. He was removed from office for abuse of power. He was overseeing this ministry to such an extent that he ignored the accountability that was in the ministry itself, and he became abusive to the people within his staff, and the elders of that church removed him from his seat of authority, and they fired him. When we put somebody in the place of God, because to be quite honest with you, there are moments when I felt more excited about these two guys than I did about my own savior at some points. I don't know who that is in your life. And that's wrong of me and I had to repent of that. I had to say, look, I can't, I can't put these guys up there with God. That's, that's wrong. Because when I do that, I put a sinful human being in a place of authority over me who has the potential to abuse that authority. Now, am I going to throw these books out now? Do I, do, I not, do I not read them anymore? I mean, in our cancel culture today, we, we have just decided that pff, we got nothing to do with these people anymore. Throw them out. Don't even talk about them. Don't even do that. Wouldn't that be true of each and every one of you sitting here? Because you've all made a mistake. I mean, I, I look at the people here in this room and either I have made a mistake to you or you have made a mistake to me and we've had to deal with it at some level for most of the people sitting here in this room. Does that mean that we just cancel each other out? Accountability, absolutely. What was lacking here under the authority was accountability. And in every church setting and in every power setting where someone is in power over the top of another, whether that's a boss over an employer, a large person over a small person, like physical power over someone, whether it's an adult over a child or whether it's a boss over an employee or a pastor over a parishioner, Without accountability and checks and balances, the sinfulness of us all will get us into trouble. I answer to the elders. I cannot, I am not the CEO of this church. I'm the chief operations officer. I take a vision and we work on it together as elders. And when that vision is agreed upon, it's my job to carry that out, to find a way to implement that. And I'm accountable to the elders. But what about you? Like Saul, it was incremental. It didn't happen overnight. It took 40 years for him to get to the place where God said, it's time now to remove you from your position and put David in the right position. Sometimes what happens is that 
people like David don't get what they need or what they've been promised right away and they have to wait because it needs to take some time in order to happen. There are things that we may not receive because the authority has yet not been given to us. Or maybe we haven't submitted yet and all the things that we need to submit in order to receive the authority. I want you to remember that when Jesus, as king, gave us authority, he said, all authority has been given to me by God the Father. Now I am sending you to go. What did he ask us to do? What's the kingdom responsibility that we are all called to carry out? What is it that he has asked us as God's people to do on his behalf? We are called to love him. That's being with him. We're called to grow in our knowledge of him. We're called to get to know Jesus better, know our Bibles better, pray. But what is it that he wants us to do with all that? What's our responsibility that we are going to use the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish? Men, this is where we need you to stand up and say, this is in my wheelhouse I have strength, physical strength. I have strength, mental strength. I have emotional strength. I can stand for the gospel and go and make disciples because that's what God has called us to do. That's our kingdom responsibility. I can stand in courage and in strength to be able to say, no one will move us to that place because that is not biblical. Men and women, we are called to kingdom responsibility with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus said, to go and make disciples, to carry out the mission of the church, which is what? To preach the good news. Am I supposed to be the preacher of the good news? Well, yes, I am, but you are all preachers as well. In your own way, with your own words, in your own places, with one person or with 10 people or with 100, God is calling us to this mission. Men and women of God, this is a call upon your life to not live the way that Saul lived, but to live the way that David lived. David was a man after God's own heart, a sinful man, certainly. But he came back to God again and again and said, Father, please forgive me for what I've done. I'm going to put you in the proper place as king. And I will receive your authority when I've submitted to you. And I'm obedient to you. And my identity is formed out of who you are, not what some, some leader in the church is like or what some mentor that you follow or some professor or some person in this church. But Jesus is the one I form my identity around. And out of that identity and authority, I can wield the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I am going to be doing it the way that Jesus did it to the best of my ability. What does that look like? As a pastor, I have desperately tried to live that out. And if you're in a situation where you have seen someone that you put up on a pedestal fall, or you experience the abuse of power in your life, you're probably very unlikely to want to put your trust in power and authority again. So what do you do? Well, first and foremost, make sure that it's Jesus up there, not some other person. Not Noah or Moses or David, even Martin Luther, John Calvin, Karl Barth, Bill Hybels, Ravi Zacharias. Goodness, there's another one who's fallen. At some point, all of them will fall. Do you know that Martin Luther was a racist against Jews? Do we throw out everything that they've said? No, because they were sinful, but... They were close to God for a while. But we've got to do it with some caution. We've got to seek truth and accountability when when we are in positions of power ourselves. We've got to be able to say, hey, if I have power over somebody else, somebody's got to have a, a checks and a balance for my life. If I'm physically powerful, more powerful than others, if I am emotionally more powerful, if I have the ability to manipulate people, some of you know that if you say certain things, people will do them for you. If I have power like that over someone, I need people in my life to have checks and balances over what's going on. And when I need to forgive because those 
people in my life who I put up as God-given examples are going to fall. And actively choosing to forgive, that's, that's raw. That's, it's dealing with the hurt. And you've got to process the pain. You know, when, when, I, when I read about what Bill Hybels had done and, you know, he was inappropriate with a person in his church and um, he just hasn't said anything about it and it was just breaking my heart because I was thinking, I, I've just put this man on such a high pedestal that now that I think about what he'd done, I just, I'm like, I heard him speak about integrity. I heard him speak about putting checks and balances into place and I had to forgive. I had to process that raw emotion because they are not Jesus. And that's, I think, what we do is we tend to think that those people who have abused power are God to us. And Jesus is not like that. Don't put someone in that place of authority who will disappoint you because they're human. And then, of course, we're called to live in the light. To bring everything out of the darkness into the light. You know, that's the scary part of transformation and discipleship and living under the submitted authority of God. It's saying, God, I'm, I'm going to give my life to this. I'm going to bring out of the darkness into the light with a group of people I trust, people who love me, not people who are going to judge me, not people who are going to make fun of me, and certainly not to everybody. But I'm going to bring this stuff out into the light. If we walk in his light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7. So what does it look like for a leader, a parent, a boss, a pastor, especially a pastor? Let's just talk about pastors for a minute. An elder. To be in this place of saying, God, you are the king. I have received authority from you, but I am submitting to you the best that I can, and I'm going to live out this authority through the power of the Spirit. What does that look like? Well, it looks like giving away everything that we possibly can because we're building kingdoms and not empires. We are not building this church. I am not building this church. The elders of this church are not building this church. We are building the kingdom of God. So we're going to give away everything that we can as often as we can to anyone that asks so that we can build the kingdom of God. We train and we send. Some of those who've sent are far better than we are. Just think of some of the people that you miss that are not here. Just think of the training that went into them and to their soul and the transformation that they've seen. Al Westerman was uh, just hired as the senior pastor in a church in Peterborough. It's just so great to see how God has blessed him. I think about the, the Dalmas who are moving on to another church. We think about all of the investment that went into their lives, both James and John and about how God used them, about how they gave their, uh, gave their lives to the Lord here at this church, and we grew them as men of God, and they grow their character and shape them, and now they're moving on to go on to other places. How many people have you seen come and go through Discovery Church because we took the opportunity to train and open our hands and say, now you can go. We see even the very raw giftings of others and name them wherever possible. I get to do this so often. I get to point out God's fingerprints in someone's life and say, don't you see God at work in your life? And I get to show people their gifts and talents. And we're going to do that again in, in in the winter. We're going to do the network course again to help you figure out your gifts. We share open doors and stages and platforms and opportunities. Uh, the Sunday after we have our combined service, Ben Peltz, who is our missionary to the indigenous community in Peterborough and in northern Quebec, he's coming to preach here to share what God has been doing, how we've been helping them do what God is calling them to do. We are quick to know our own places of failure and we repent. That's a tough one. I've had those hard conversations with people here, some of you sitting here. 
We are bold and confident in Christ, the only hero of our story. We sift the grit from the beauty in our history. We disregard, discard even the smallest roots of bitterness. We plant hope. We are expectant for the future. We seek and find the presence of Jesus. With us in all things, we know that all is grace. I cannot live up to that list 100%. But we are here to try, to do as God asks us to. You are part of that journey. Men and women of courage, faith, conviction, strength. To be able to take on the kingdom responsibility as God has called us to and to carry it out under the full submission to the work of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, go and preach the good news. Heal the sick. Pray for your friends who are sick saying, I want to put my hands on you. I believe the power of the Holy Spirit can heal. We want to break the chains of addiction here in this church and with the friends that you have and the people in your community. Can we together as God's people say that we will take up the responsibility that God has called us to? Amen? Amen. That's what we are called to. And the story of Saul and David is just such a perfect example of how it can go so well. Where David carried out the will of God. He walked in humility before God. He did as God asked as a sinful human being who had to repent and go back to God and he had to deal with the consequences of his sin. But God called him a man after his own heart. I'm sorry I've gone long today. I wonder how the messy story of our church will be told 10 years from now. It's almost like we're starting over again. The pandemic has pushed away a lot of the things that we have accomplished, kind of wiped the slate clean. Some people have joined us in that short time since the pandemic and others have moved on. We need clear boundaries, accountability, and the willingness to be courageous in taking up the task of kingdom responsibility. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God, for the example of Saul and David, a tense and difficult reminder of what could go wrong. For those of us here who've experienced the abuse of power, Lord, help us to see you as king, that you are the one in charge of changing the government, the employer, the parenting situation, the relationship between someone and the church. And God, for us who have places of authority, would you help us to submit daily to you? Remind us that you are king and that we are your vice regents here with limited authority and power to carry out the mission that you've called us to, to love others, to see some get to know you, to heal the sick, to set them free, to forgive sin, In Jesus' name, amen.